I was covering companies and getting through the day, you know, nice and easy. And one day they said, go to Vienna and cover an OPEC meeting. I'm thinking, ay, 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 what am I going to do here? I got to go and cover a meeting that's a private meeting. I'm thinking, how on earth do I do this? I knew nothing about the oil market. I was very lucky when I arrived that there was a journalist from a competing channel who was an old friend who had come in to visit me in a previous life in another job and walked out with a job from there. So I said, aha, darling, you owe me big time. So you're going to sit down and tell me all I need to know about this. And it was a combination of that and meeting one of the advisors to the ministers. He actually said, the only guy you need to know in this industry is the advisor to one of the ministers. And suddenly he just said, he said, and there he is. And I don't know what it was. I was up off my seat talking to this guy. And within 10 minutes, I'm sitting in a hotel room, yes, in Vienna, with an Arab gentleman thinking my mother would not approve. But he's drawing out where oil comes from. And I thought, OK, I know I said I didn't know anything, but that's a bit basic. But a combination of that got me up to speed um, covering the oil industry. It, was, uh, it needed something like that. But an even funnier story about being thrown into the uh, financial markets. When I worked a long, long time ago, this was just after I came back from America, and I was freelancing in London. And it was very funny. I was thrown into ITN, the independent news operation, one night. And I was a regular journalist. Um, and one night, one b person said to me, Etna, call James Capel in New York and get the closing prices. So I called up and said, hello, it's Etna Trainer at ITN in London. Is James there? I'm looking for James Capel. And they said, you are now, are you? And they kind of played along with this a bit. And I said, yes, yes, I'm looking for James Capel and I need the closing prices. Um, and they said, well, James is not here at the moment. And I could see this look across the room thinking, what a total idiot. And I guess they all presumed, well, maybe James Capel was out having a little cocktail with Arthur Anderson or somebody like that. You know, James Capel had long died. It was the name of the company. Um, but I didn't know that. So, I mean, we're talking really sad basics here. And I can look back on that now and think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Himself and Arthur Anderson. Just as well they didn't call me, tell me call up Arthur Anderson and get some prices. But these things happen. This is, you know, a new journalist. You're thinking, ay, ay, ay. And funny, when I went to work at Bloomberg then, I literally said to them, I met Mike Bloomberg, and I said to him, why do you want to hire me? I said, I'm, I'm not a financial journalist. Um, and I said to him, you know, I said, the difference between sort of your people and mine, between you and me, is I know where Burkina Faso is, and I actually care. To which they kind of looked at me and went, what? Um, but they still hired me. So, but I was coming in for a very different reason. I was coming in to set up their television operation in Europe. So I looked at the figures and thought, how long would I work at BBC to make that much money? And then I thought and thought and thought and thought, this is actually a very, very challenging operation to come and help them set up their television organization. So again, I quickly came up to speed and kind of forgot a little bit about Burkina Faso. My friends at BBC said, no, 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 you're selling out. You're selling out dreadful place. They run that place down there like it's the city. It's a bunch of heavy-duty barrow boys just wheeling and dealing and trading. And I remember I'd come from BBC World Service, the kind of United Nations of journalism, the sort of higher intellectual. And then I go on the trading floor, so to speak. So it was a bit of a culture shock. But um, you'll find an awful lot of stories. There's not a whole lot of financial, trained financial journalists who sort of decide, this is my career path. And since then, I have trained in Pakistan, in Russia, in the United Arab Emirates, in Saudi Arabia, financial television journalists. And you've got to think this is all a first for them. None of them are financial journalists. Some we take from the print and teach them how to do television. But for me, it's an awful lot more in a way about their delivery and style rather than thinking, do they really, really know what's going on? I'm presuming they do. But actually, after these two days, I'm really beginning to worry. Never mind, a man who's going to put that all right is our next speaker. Now, he's a gentleman who's been the online correspondent for BBC in Washington, covering the political situation, also covered the Iraq war in terms of the online coverage, but more important, and for us today, too. He has also covered uh, the BBC online service as an economics correspondent and particularly on the series that many of you might have seen on the anniversary of the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, Aftershock. He is now a professor of financial journalism at the City of University in London. So please, please welcome Stephen Schifferis. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
man who's going to put it all to right for us. And Thanks. I didn't know there was a degree level in financial journalism, so I'm absolutely thrilled to hear this. Thanks. The yes, we're starting the first in, the, uh, in, in Britain next September. Great. And can we just um, can I have a little clicker? Great. Thanks very much. And I really enjoyed uh, Jacob's the previous presentation. In a sense, I'm going to really be talking from the, exactly from the other side how we were feeling in the newsrooms in August 2007, just as how you were feeling in the banks when everything was, was going down and how we perceived it. And just to say a little bit, first of all, about my role in it, I was the online economics correspondent during this period. So we were really trying to understand from August 2007, the last two years, what was going on, what was the meaning of this crisis. Um, the BBC structure, I think, is another important thing. We've talked a little bit about uh, previously the relationship between the financial journalists, the editors, and so forth. And I think this is a significant factor in uh, explaining the coverage. And just to talk about the BBC structure is uh, important in this. We had an integrated business news center where online journalists, TV, radio, world business journalists and UK journalists all sat together, talked together. So we were able to kind of every morning discuss the crisis among the 150 journalists in the center who were all covering it, including the sort of editors of the day, and try to make sense of these events as they were happening. We also were trying to relate to the editors of the overall programs, all our, on our separate channels. We had something called a multimedia newsroom, which again, was a joint operation uh, on a separate floor where the agenda of the news, what was going to be the lead story, what was going to get on the bulletins, was decided. And I think the relationship between these two sides was quite difficult, particularly in the early stages of the crisis, when it was, you know, the stock markets weren't collapsing and, you know, the banks weren't panicking or they weren't panicking publicly. It was much harder to convince the main newsroom the importance of this story. And I think that's one of the things to say about this. The other issue, I think, for financial journalists in covering this story is the relationship between the other rival sections of journalists who also want to cover this story, in particular, the political journalists, who also believe that this is essentially a political story because the political leaders are making the decisions and also the political leaders, in a sense, are suffering the consequences. So there's an inherent rivalry between financial and political journalists once this story reaches a certain level. And I mean, I'll try to give a sort of narrative account of some of the key moments in the crisis from my point of view as a BBC journalist, and then try to draw some broader conclusions about that. But one of the things that will come up again in this story is the relationship between these two sections of the BBC, both trying to lead on the story. So the thing that I want to start with, in August 2007, when this happened, I mean, we all felt something very serious was going on. But it was very hard, first of all, to evaluate how serious this seizure of the credit markets was. In this sense, the policymakers themselves were very divided about the significance of this event. And I'd heard, I've heard subsequently from people on the Fed staff that Bernanke, I think the word was, was dumbfounded by the closure of these markets. The, the, as you know, in August 2007, as Jake was explaining, the uh, Paribas warning that some of their funds were not being able to be valued because you didn't know the value of these structured credit products caused a seizure of the entire residential mortgage-backed security market. It completely froze. People could not, these assets, of which the major banks were holding hundreds of billions, were no longer tradable. And if a market is no longer tradable, you can't value them. In theory, if you believe that means their value is zero, all the banks in the world are basically underwater. Now, the issue that we had was none of the banks wanted to admit that. And none of the banks wanted to say what the value of these securities was. Because to say it, and indeed to try to trade them, was, as you were saying, taking a bite out of the cake and to reveal just how worthless they were. So no one wanted to trade these securities because it would immediately, the price discovery would knock the value of every single bank share in the world. So we had a very strange period uh, where we were waiting every time there was a statement from the banks, what are you going to say? What are you going to value these? And we got 